Hi, this is Ms. Fastido here to record a video about Unit 3, Topic 1. And so uh, Unit 3, Topic 1 is separated into two parts. Uh, the first is biodiversity and the second part is classification processes. So uh, this will just be over the first part of classification, which will uh, really be more about species classification. And there'll be a separate video over ecosystem classification um, a bit later on. So before we start, um, I thought it might be good to go ahead and, and define what is biodiversity. And so biodiversity is, is all of the variety of life on Earth. Um, we can think of even, even bacteria and fungus and plants, uh, animals, obviously. Um, so all of those, all the different variety on, on Earth would be included in that in that description of biodiversity, um, but it also includes the genetic material, so the DNA uh, that gives life to those characteristics um, that give these characteristics or give them these adaptations that have allowed them to survive. And then we also talk about biodiversity in terms of ecosystems, and so um, that ecosystems is where they live and they survive, and we'll talk about ecosystems a bit later. And so here we have an ecosystem that includes both living and non-living things. And so we have, um, when we talk about living and non-living, we refer to them as biotic and abiotic. And so can you, can you name some, if you look at this picture here, um, this is a, a pond of some sort. Um, if you could name an abiotic factor here, which would be a not living factor, you might include um, this uh, clearly air pollution that's given off from the city in the, in the distance. Uh, you might talk about temperature or humidity. The water itself would be abiotic. Um, and then when we talk about biotic, we're talking about the living things. So living or once living. So we're talking about these microbes that we can't even see, um, but they've zoomed in here. We're talking about the fish and the turtles, but we're also talking about the trees and the fungus and the bacteria. Um, all of those things would be included in those biotic things within an ecosystem. And so an ecosystem is all of the biotic and abiotic factors um, that in, in that area. And so when we're referring to ecosystems, we're not just referring to the living things, but we're also referring to the not living things. And so when we start talking about classification, um, classification can be based on three different things. And so we'll talk about each of these in more detail, but the first one is classification. Can We can group organisms by their physical features and what they look like. Secondly, we could group organisms based on their method of reproduction or their um, their way in which they reproduce. So this could be sexual and asexual. It could be their life strategy, like R and K selection. We'll talk about that a bit later. And then lastly, we can classify organisms based on their molecular sequence. So either their DNA or their amino acid sequence and their proteins. And so now we're going to just uh, talk a little bit more detail about each of those. And so the Linnaean system, this is Linnaeus here, um, came up with this system of classifying organisms based on their physical characteristics. And so the largest one here, move this over so you can see it, um, is a domain. And so there's three different domains. We'll talk about those in a minute. And that all organisms on Earth are within those three domains. And then within each domain, we have different kingdoms. And so... Um, it gets a little bit more specific. And then from kingdoms, we have phylums. From phylums, class, class. Then we go to order, family, genus. And then finally, we get to the species. And so this um, would be um, the way in which we classify organisms based on their physical features. And we call this the Linnaean system. Um, now, we can still use sort of this naming system and use molecular sequences and, and have re- uh, reclassified species based on molecular sequences. Um, but in general, the way that this was originally done was based on their physical characteristics. And so easy way to remember this might be to think of a mnemonic device. And so did King Philip come over for great spaghetti? I think in class I said green spaghetti. This is Dear King Philip Came Over for Grape Soda. Whatever helps you remember it. If you could come up with your own, that would be great. 
um, whatever helps you kind of remember that order. Uh, sometimes we can get a few of those confused or just forget the name, and so sometimes having a some kind of mnemonic device helps. So the three domains that exist are bacteria. Sometimes it's called U bacteria, E U bacteria, and then we have RK bacteria, and then we have Eukarya, and so. Within these, um, you can think of bacteria, you bacteria are really the bacteria that you know, um, the bacteria that you've heard of. These are the true bacteria. Um, they don't have a nucleus. They don't have organelles. They don't have enclosed um, organelles within membranes. Um, they have naked DNA. We've talked about all of those things before. Um, and so these bacteria um, are, you know, E. coli or salmonella. These are the ones that you're thinking about. RK bacteria are, live in extreme environments, and so we likely have never really encountered these, but these are extremophiles. Um, so these are typically microbes or prokaryotes or bacteria, but they live in these extreme environments. So an example of that would be they found some bacteria that live in the Dead Sea, and in the Dead Sea we have this really salty environment where no other living thing can exist, and so that is... Um, an example of an RK bacteria. Uh, another example could be in a hot spring. If there was a bacteria living in a hot spring, that that would be um, an RK bacteria. Um, and then the last one is eukarya. So everything that's not a U bacteria or an RK bacteria is in the eukarya. So these are protists and fungi and plants and animals. All of those would be in the, the domain of eukarya. And so if we looked at the classification of one species, for instance, so I had you do this in class, but I thought I'd just do one for you. Um, is, so this is the platypus, and it's in the domain Eukarya. Its kingdom is Animalia, because it's an animal. Its phylum is Chordata. Chordata is all of the vertebrates, so we say chordates sometimes. Um, and so that's all of the vertebrates. It's a mammal, so it's in the class Mammalia. It is a monotreme, so it is in the order monotremata, and, and monotremes are egg-laying mammals. Uh, there's only, I think, three species of egg-laying mammals left on Earth, um, and this is one of them. And then this is its order, and then we have the genus, and then we have the species. So when you get to the species um, name, we would write it with the genus, and you could just, uh, you don't have to write out the full genus, although you could, um, and then um, you could abbreviate it here just with the first letter, and you capitalize that, but we don't capitalize the species name. And really, this should be in italics, or it should be underlined, and that would be the proper way. We call that binomial nomenclature, and that's how we, it's called the two-name system, binomial, and that's how we name organisms. And so when you, you would never just say the species name, you would use the genus, then the species name. So another method for classification would be to look at sexual versus asexual reproduction. So if we're not looking at physical characteristics to classify an organism, we could classify them based on sexual and asexual reproduction. And so um, asexual reproduction just means they make clones of themselves, and so they don't reproduce using sex cells. Um, they produce sexual uh, reproduction means that they're producing genetically different offspring from sex cells. And so Obviously, typically, there would be a sperm and egg involved here. And so what kind of organisms do asexual reproduction? Well, we know that bacteria do binary fission um, when they reproduce. Uh, but we also know that hydras, for instance, do asexual reproduction. We also know that plants can do asexual reproduction. Now, plants can do both, oftentimes, asexual and sexual. And so, But we could have a plant cutting and um, create a new organism, and so that would be asexual reproduction. In this case, we're creating genetically identical offspring. So there's some real um, differences between these two. Some organisms are able to go between the two, although you don't really need to know about that, as long as you can understand that this is a way that we might classify organisms. Another way that we might classify them is based on R and K selection. And so this is a life strategy, essentially. And so our selected species, we remember that by roach. Roaches are our selected. So they can live in very variable and unpredicted circumstances, like you see cockroaches all around the world in every environment. Um, their mortality is usually density independent. So it doesn't matter how many there are. 
the thing that's going to kill them is going to be, you know, you're spraying pesticide on them. And so it didn't really matter how many there were. Um, there's not a lot of competition between them is what that means. Um, they're, they typically reproduce in great numbers. They usually have are small in size, and they usually have a really short lifespan. Um, and they, they usually mature quite early in life. So a case-selected species is on the other end of this spectrum, and a K, an extreme case-selected would be like a koala. So an easy way for you to remember it would be the R for roach and the K for koala. So the, the case-selected species, they're usually bigger. They usually are, they really survive best when there is a predictable environment, stable environment. Um, and they're usually dying because of density dependent factors. So leading to competition. So because they're competing for food or space or um, habitat or something like that. Um, they typically, their survivorship is constant and they are large, uh, they mostly die in adult age. Um, they are large in size. I think I said that already. Um, they usually wait to reproduce. They usually nurture their young, although not necessarily always, but usually um, nurturing their young to some extent. And so the key to remembering this is that this is a continuum. So no, some species are extreme R and some are extreme K, like the koala and like the roach. But most species are somewhere between the two. And so trying to figure out where a species lies in this continuum is probably the harder part. But as long as you understand sort of characteristics of each um, and that that's a way that we could classify organisms. And then the last way we can classify organisms is based on molecular sequences. So we can look at, and these are examples, although I um, won't go into too much detail about these right now. These are based on amino acids. So this question here is from an old exam, um, but it's basically saying this is the number of amino acid differences between these two species. And this is of a certain protein, cytochrome C. And so the more differences they are, the, the, the less related they are. And the fewer differences there are, the more related. So we would say the ferrous and this Africanus, that they are the most closely related because they have the fewest number of differences in their sequence. And we can do the same here. And so usually what we do, this is another example or different species here, but we look at the human one and then we say, who is different? Well, how many differences do they have total? And so that's how you determine who is most closely related of all of these to the human. And so that leads to cladistics. And so cladistics is when we are grouping organisms, including their common ancestor and all of their descendants. And so we're organizing them based on their common ancestor. And so there are some assumptions when we're doing cladistics. And so we, one of our assumptions is that there is common ancestry. So that means they must, all life on earth shares a common ancestor. Um, that there's bifurcation. So bi means two. And what that means is when a lineage divides, so there's a common ancestor, and when they divide, they divide into two groups. And so they don't divide into three or four groups. They just divide into two groups. And the other assumption is that characteristics or physical appearance changes over time. And so here's what a cladogram looks like. And so a clade here, because I've said circle a clade, a clade is a group of organisms with the common ancestor plus all of their descendants. So there are, there's way more than one right answer here when I say circle a clade. For instance, we could circle this clade. So this is the common ancestor. Our common ancestor is always the point at which it divides or bifurcation happens. And so um, I'll identify that in a minute, but this is the common ancestor here. And all of their descendants are part of a clade. Now, that's not the only right answer. So if I said circle a clade, you could circle this clade. This is a common ancestor here. And then these are the two descendants. We could also circle this whole thing because this is the common ancestor and these are all their descendants. You could also just circle these two. You could just circle these two. So there's lots of right answers there. So then identify three common ancestors. I just sort of put a little smiley face there, but each of these would be a common ancestor, but there's more, right? So there's this one and this one. Anytime that it divides, 
and you have that fork in the road, you could think of that way, that's going to be where the common ancestor was. And so when we look at this, if we look back at this question that I showed a couple of slides ago, we could try to figure out the um, order in which these species are um, listed on here. And so what I would start with is who has the most differences from each other? And so if we look at that, it's this one. Ferris and Polop. Polylepis have the most differences. They have 21, which means they have to be on opposite ends of this um, tree. And so we would put them at opposite ends. But we know Ferris and Africanus are actually only one difference. So I would put Ferris here and Africanus here because they're really closely related. And then over here, we would have the one that's the least related to Ferris, which is Polylepis, and we put him on the end. And then that leaves us with these two. And so then we have to figure out if Ferris is on this end here, who's going to be the most, who's closely related to Ferris? Well, it would either be one of these two. And so those two would go here. And so when we read that, that's what that would look like. And so um, we'll do some practice of those in class, but that kind of gives you an idea. We just look at who, the way that I do it is I look at who has the most differences and put them on opposite ends and start there. And then you can kind of work from there. And so then now we want to look at what makes a species. Um, a species is, uh, the biological definition of a species has to do with that there must be, species must be able to reproduce with each other um, in order to be their own species. And that means that they have to be able to reproduce and produce offspring that are fertile and viable. And so we do have examples of infertile hybrids, like a mule. So when a, a horse and a donkey mate, they do produce an offspring, but they are still not the same species because the mule that they produce is not fertile. And so when we talk about what is the defini definition of a species, um, that's sort of an important part of that. Now, in order to form a new species, some sort of reproductive isolation had to have occurred. And so this could happen in many ways, and we'll talk about this more in Unit 4, but there are different types of behaviors like mating dances or the time of year that the mating occurs. And so those behaviors, if they change, that would cause the species to form, it would cause a formation of a new species because they would no longer mate with each other. If they're physically separated from each other, they may no longer mate with each other. Um, if they live in different parts of the environment, they may no longer mate with each other. Um, and if they have a different arrangement of genetic material, so if they have an extra chromosomes or something like that, there might not be, um, mating could might not be able to happen. And so there are some problems with defining a species in the, in the way that we just said. And so one of the problems is we have species that reproduce asexually. And so how do we determine when those species become their own species, um, a new species? And so because they don't produce offspring in natural settings and we can't really test them because they're producing clones of themselves, that could be one that might be difficult to define in that way. Um, there are species called ring species, and this is a little bit of a hard concept, but it, it, it leads that if we looked at these birds, for instance, they're all living in different places. The further, and they mate with each other. They exchange alleles, uh, or we haven't really talked about alleles, but they exchange their genetic material with each other. And so they do, but then there is a case where maybe some of them don't. The further away they get from each other, the less likely they are to reproduce with each other. And so we call this a ring species, but even though this one reproduces with this one and this one reproduces with that one, these two don't reproduce. And so that could lead to the formation of a new species. And so then the question is, are they actually new species or not? And so that kind of leads to, because there is sort of some exchange of genetic material along the ring, but not between these two directly. Some other difficulties with defining that species is we do have some organisms that are infertile. So we look at honeybees, for instance. Um, they have one fertile queen, um, fertile males, and a whole bunch of infertile females. And so at what point would they become um, a different species? 
Um, and then there are cases where embryos can develop without fertilization. We call this parthenogenesis. And when this happens uh, in certain species, how do, how do then do we say that a new species is formed, um, that it could be hard based on our biological definition? And so just some examples, you should just understand that it's difficult to define a species in that way uh, due to these sort of exceptions. Um, another one is we have members of the same species, but not enough to separate them. We call those varieties. And so a house dog is a, you know, a common example. We have this poodle here, and then we have my two sweet cocker spaniels here, Omar and Diego. And um, obviously these are very different looking, right? But they're the same species. We also have um, subspecies. And so these two, the poodle and my cocker spaniels, could mate and um, probably not produce a very cute dog, but maybe. Um, I think um, that's actually a breed that's common. Um, but if, if they mate, they could produce offspring. Um, these are both Canis lupus familiaris, so they are subspecies. They are the same species as a wolf. And so, you know, my cocker spaniels could technically mate with a wolf um, and produce viable fertile offspring. And so that's saying that sometimes, even though that's not likely to occur, uh, it would be possible. And, you know, another example of that would be all these different subspecies of black cockatoo. At what point are they going to become? They are quite separated from each other to some extent. Obviously, they can fly, but they are only found in certain areas. And so at what point do they become their own species? We can, also, we can also classify organisms based on their interactions, so predation or competition, symbiosis or disease. And so predation, that was when an organism kills and eats another. Um, this one is more about um, competition that could be within a species or among different species. And so that could be for food or water or mate. Symbiosis, we'll talk about each of those in just a moment. And then disease and infection and interaction between a pathogen and its host. Um, how, how that's another way that we could classify a species. So within those three, we have mutualism. Mutualism is when both species benefit from their interaction. They are happy. They're both benefiting. This would be like the sea anemone and the clownfish. So the the clownfish is protected by the sea anemone, um, but at the same time, the sea anemone, um, because the clownfish is brightly colored, it attracts other fish to that area, which is good for the sea anemone. And there's some other benefits as well. Commensalism is when one benefits, but the other one is neither harmed nor helped. And so the barnacle and the whale would be an example. The barnacle is feeding off of the whale. The whale is not harmed, but it's not helped necessarily. And then Parasitism would be when we have um, one being helped, one getting what they need, and the other one being harmed. And so, you know, a paralysis tick on a dog would be a good example of that. And so we call all of these symbiosis, which just means a close relationship between two species. I hope that video uh, didn't go too fast, but you can always rewind it and rewatch it. And um, Diego and Omar, hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, let me know.